Welcome to the Coach's Playground. I am your host, Gavin McHale, and I'm so excited you're here. This podcast is for all the coaches out there who are ready to play at a higher level and make a dent in their industry. Inside, I take a look into the minds of some incredible coaches and share some tips and tricks I've picked up while playing the games of business and life. I wanna show you that business, like life, is nothing but a playground where you can make mistakes, have fun, and learn about yourself and the world around you. New episodes drop every Wednesday, so be sure to hit subscribe and get the notification every time we release a new episode. Give me a follow on Instagram, at Gavin McHale one where I share different clips and episode breakdowns with each guest. And finally, if you're enjoying this podcast and you find something valuable, please share it with a friend or take a screenshot and pop it into social media so we can get more coaches playing on this incredible playground. Hey, we are kicking off the month of October with an absolute beauty. I was joined by another internet friend of mine, Griffin Gervais, and you can hear through the interview, we just, we connect so deeply and there's just such this like great back and forth between the two of us about some of the mindset work we talk about. And so Griffin is, he was originally an educator and now he's turned a mindset and best self coach. So he spent nine years in the profession of education. He was a classroom teacher. He was a coach. He was an administrator. And he's now focused on serving individuals who want to step into their confidence and step into their best self again. A common thread through the span of his life has always been building strong relationships, helping others develop a toolkit to step into their most authentic, confident, and true selves. And Griffin believes that everything is a journey, but the first step is through the development and understanding of self. And we really dive into that self-awareness piece because that's, I think, one of the one of the hardest things, it's like, you know, getting the boulder moving. Once it's moving, it's a lot easier. But Griffin primarily focuses on working with men who are wanting to step into their confidence and what he calls pure masculinity again. His FEMA approach, which stands for foundation, emotional intelligence, mindset, and action, helps men gain clarity towards understanding who they want to be and creating the life they want to live. And, you know, whether you're a man or not, we just dive into some of these concepts so deeply, and I really think that it can be beneficial for anybody listening. So without further ado, Griffin Gervais, we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Coach's Playground. I'm super pumped after being on his podcast, after having a conversation that could have gone for three to four hours a few weeks back. I'm super excited to welcome Griffin, and we're going to go with the Canadian the Canadian version, Griffin Gervais, onto the podcast. Welcome, friend. Hey, Gavin. How you doing? I am. I am better now, and I'm going to be better in in about 45 minutes after we just hammer this uh, amazing conversation out with the record button on. Let's dive in. We have a lot of similarities. We obviously met through a mutual friend, Corey Camp, who is an absolute gem. Can't say enough about him. And I appreciate you reaching out. Actually, let's talk about that. This yeah. is going to put you on the spot after I said I wouldn't put you on the spot. No, let's do it. The value for you. So I am constantly talking about the importance of just having conversations, especially when we're starting in business. The value for you of starting conversations as a real human being on social media. What do you think? I think it's so often overlooked because... I think especially stepping into a space, and I'm only going to speak from my experience, but, you know, coming out of education, transitioning to be an entrepreneur and a coach, there's so much pressure to create, 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 and start creating revenue and money and and things like that. And what's so often overlooked is just the connections and the relationships and the trust that starts to be built. And right at the beginning of it, I had, I, I was trying to balance both and I always found myself leaning in the create side. And I had a reminder to myself of like, what am I creating for? I'm not creating for anyone because I haven't connected. I haven't built relationships. And it was really letting go of those expectations and, and thinking about what, what do I really want to be able to do? And I really wanted to be able to build trusting relationships with people. And once I was able to gain clarity on that, And once I was able to really just be like, it doesn't really matter whether they respond to me or not. I just want to start reaching out to people and have a genuine conversation, not because I'm trying to sell something, not because I'm trying to enroll you in anything. 
because I just want to connect, build a relationship and show support for one another. Once that started to take place, it's been really cool to just start to see all the different connections and similarities that we all have in different spaces. And what's beautiful is like, Hey, some of those might become clients or maybe they'll know someone who's, who's a potential client or whatever, whatever it is. Correct. One of the things that you touched on there that I just, you know, we've been really digging into. So a lot of our clients are creating content or they're trying to, and that's what they've been told. You got to create, create, create what, and who am I creating for? I mean, like yeah. we see so many pieces of content that people put out that we just, me and my team, we, we just shake our head. We're like, what, what are you doing? Yeah. What was that for? And I think that's the number one problem. And then, and then on the flip side of it, you've, we as a whole now in the coaching world have been, you know, bombarded with so many bad DM messages and bad cold messages that now it's like, well, I'm, I'm the asshole if I'm reaching out to someone, but you know, the way you did it, even just speaking to that, like just those of you who, who weren't in the DMS with Griffin and I, it was like, Hey man, we have this mutual connection, which was Corey, but could be anything could be freaking dogs or sports or whatever. You seem like a pretty cool guy. Would you want to talk some more? Yeah, (laughs) pretty much. Or, or like open-ended question. How do you know him moving on? And then we actually have a conversation and then, you know, it has led to some awesome podcast conversations who knows where it will lead in the future, but you know, that the act of doing that more and more and more is not only going to help you create better content, but then also going to help you connect more. Is there anything more there that, uh, that, that spurred for you? You know, to me, it was just a reminder and you mentioned it like intention. So often we can see coaches just firing stuff out Mm. and there's just this pressure. Like you were saying, push out, push out, push out. And it's like, well, who are you speaking to? Who's your audience? Like, you, you don't have any grounding or clarity on who that is because you're just trying to go. There's so much beauty and peace in, in slowing yourself down, bringing yourself back to like grounding of what are my intentions behind what I want to post? What are my intentions on what I even want to speak to? What I even want to do? Who do I want to work with? And once I got clear on my intentions, it was so easy because in my mind, I'm not playing this game with myself of, okay, I'm speaking with Gavin right now. Like, what's the right thing to say to Gavin? It was like, no, 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 no. I'm just genuinely interested in you. I just, I just want to get to know you. And then, and, and, and then you have faith that that genuine interest and curiosity will lead to the next question that yeah. won't be weird. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's exactly. such a, such a nice, it, it creates some freedom right? It's like, I don't have to like say the right thing. I can just like, like anybody out there, if you've ever had a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you know how to have a conversation. So, you know, you'll be okay. And I had, you know, just based on that too, Gavin, like I had some people who responded back and they were like, Hey, I appreciate you reaching out. But unfortunately in my experiences, like those calls have really ended up being like sales pitches. So at the moment right now, like you know, just keep doing what you're doing. And at that point for me, I'm not taking it personally. I'm not like, why don't they want to talk to me? It's like, cool. All right. I reached out. They weren't interested at that time. You know, maybe at some point down the road we do, but it's led to really cool connections. It's led to really great conversations. We can, we can, we can get a sense of each other on social media, but there's so much power in just pausing to have an actual conversation and hear one another. Funny, we've we've come full circle in 2021 to just have conversations, right? And yeah, I, right. I also love like it. It you know, yes, it takes the pressure off, but then it also like you know, you don't you don't end up getting butt hurt about it. Like obviously, yeah. it's kind of like oh, that sucks, but hey, you know what? Now at least I have a better idea of what that person feels. I also have a better idea of how to approach other conversations and how to right. make sure that I'm coming across very clearly as the human being that I am, not the salesperson. Correct. Um, I just, I've found so many people really say to me when I have conversations this way, and it ends up being like that I can help them. Like, I really appreciate the way you approach this. And it's like, yeah, yeah well, exactly. <laughs> Cause I approached it as a human being. 
Yeah. And, and that's, and, and I don't remember, like, and I know we, we touched base about a month ago or maybe even longer. Um, but a lot of what I do when I hop on those calls with people is I tell them my intention. I literally like verbalize it. I'm like, Hey, my intention for this call right now is blank. So there's no guessing. There's no assumptions. It's like, I want to know your story. I want to know what's going on for you and your work. Is there even ways we can support each other? If not cool, like, let me know. Thanks for the, thanks for the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think it's, I just really like that we've gone there. And I think, you know, even just, this is a lesson for in living your life, right? Intention being one of the most important things, right? Like if I'm going for a walk to get some fresh air, that's going to be very different than if I'm going for a walk to try and burn calories, right? right? Like that's going to be very different in how I approach it. It's going to be very different in how my mind works throughout it. Instead of like, what's my pace? It's like, yeah. Oh, well, that's a nice tree or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's just very different intentions. And it, it, when you set it, th- this is something we actually do on sales calls too, is we, we pre-frame it. It's like, Hey, here's what you can expect on this call. Yeah. So now everything's out in the open. We're going to do this, right. this, and this, and then this. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I can do that. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Now let's actually talk instead of you worrying the whole time. Like when's the pitch coming? When's this, when's that, you know? And I I realized too, just, just to kind of wrap that up, but I realized too, if you don't set intention emotionally, sometimes you leave like confused or frustrated or resentful. And, and it's because you haven't clearly grounded yourself in why you're doing what you're doing. And so you go and do something, right? You go for that walk and then you're, you're frustrated because you feel like you wasted time, but it was like, well, if you took the time to think about what's my intention to go on that walk, then you would have a frame of reference going into it rather than now beating yourself up because you're like, well, I just wasted an hour of my time. And this is, you know, that go, go, go world we're in, right? Yeah. Is like, well, I just got to do the thing that I'm supposed to do next or that's on the schedule next. It's like, okay, well, why? Right. Why you're, you know, time is currency. Time is, is such an important right. currency. So if, and that this is another thing, right? Like, if you had, like, if we didn't have a connection point and then you hadn't set the intentions, I mean, for me, I get on a lot of phone calls every day. So a 30 minute call can be somewhat challenging, but you set the intention and then look at where it's taken us. We've actually yeah. been able to create a relationship, sure. which is amazing. But yeah, I would, I would, uh, a great lesson to take out of that is just make sure you're a little more aware and set intentions for everything you do. Anything that's taking your time should be intentional. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. If you are trying to pitch people, be clear with yourself that your intention is to pitch. Like if it's the, nothing's wrong or right. right, just be clear with yourself. And you can say to someone, Hey, uh, you know, would you mind if I ask you some questions to see if I'd be able to help you? Yeah. It's not like you have to say like, buy my shit now. <laughs> yeah. I, in fact, please don't, <laughs> please yeah. don't. We've heard yeah. it enough. One thing that uh, we, we did connect on when, when we initially connected was our, our former athlete story, or as Corey likes to call it, our forever athlete story. Right. And I'm conflicted with that in some ways. In a lot of ways, I love you know the forever athlete idea because there's so many amazing things that can go along with the athlete mentality and the positives of that. But what where I think we could have a great little conversation around is some of the, I found that in, in graduating or retiring from my sport and moving into business world or just life, there was a lot of things from sports that I actually had to unlearn and I'm continuing to unlearn you being a a soccer guy, basketball guy, what would you say were some of the things from sports, from growing up, uh, playing competitive sports that you've had to unlearn as you, as you grow into adulthood, mm-hmm. relationships, businesses, all that stuff. Yeah. You know, wow, there's so much, right? I will say, you know, the whole, the whole idea of perseverance, determination, teamwork, collaboration, community, those were all things that I'm, I'm very grounded in. And a lot of that were foundational from sports. Um, but more of it was on the side of, I, I've had to unlearn the idea of perfection. I've had to unlearn 
being okay, accepting my emotions and being open and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, because in a sports sense, right. It was all about, it was all about making sure that you were performing at the best ability and that you were perfect so that you ended up starting. So you ended up getting the accolades. You ended up getting the acknowledgement from your coach. Again, it created great things in some of the determination and things like that, but it was hard because my mind was not about a process. It was about where's the perfectionism so that I'm doing it in the eyes of someone else, not for myself, for, mm-hmm. for someone else. So that was something I really had to unlearn as I got older, as I got into relationships, as I got into my career um, about, about being okay with things not being perfect or going perfectly. And then the other, the other piece was, you know, growing up in sports, it was always, it was always, uh, Hey, you got to toughen up or, Hey, you just got to get out there, hold your chest up high. Like, just keep going, keep going. You know, <laughs> it's, it's going to be okay. And especially and, when we were growing up, right. It's like, yeah, I have no idea yeah. how to deal with you having emotions right now. So just toughen up and show. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that too, because the, I, I will put a disclaimer on that saying, I think now in sports, it's becoming more prevalent to kind of build the picture of the whole person and work through the both mental and mental and physical aspects of it. But when we grew up, it was just the physical aspect. Yeah. It was just, like, just do the thing. It was like, I don't have time to deal with your bullshit. I need you on the field and I need you performing at your best. Yeah. I need yeah. you on the ice. I need you performing at your best. Yeah. Um, so really understanding vulnerability and openness so that how, what I was feeling and how I was feeling, I could express in a powerful, meaningful way and not have self doubt or the idea that I'm weak or I'm failing because I'm feeling a certain way. The, the, man, there's so many threads I want to pull here, but I love how you, so perfection, that, that idea of perfection to me, like for me, the way I framed that very similar was the fixed versus growth mindset, right? Like the right. idea of perfection is I'm on stage. I have to show you how good I am so that you can judge me positively. And then I can right. get the things that I want. Right. But what's the really interesting part about what you said is in the eyes of someone else, Mm-hmm we had to be, we had to perform based on what someone else said was the performance standard. The standard. Yeah. Right. So our coach, our scout, uh, you know, the league, whatever the judge, someone else was telling us what was good and what was bad. And one of the things that I continue to have to fight every day and talk myself down from is trying to be perfect in the eyes of our society or trying to yeah. fit in, in the eyes of, because when you lose the coach or even I, I went from sports right into university. So I, I went from coach. Okay. What does the coach want from me? Okay. Now what does the teacher want from me? Right. What does the prof want from me to, Oh fuck, I don't have any, anything now. So it's, yeah. well, what is the general world around me saying? Yeah. That's what I'll go for, which leads to wild mediocrity and unhappiness. It's, it's, it's the idea and it's, it's the, it's the mind. It's, it's what sticks with you and you have to unlearn in terms of like performance and being on the stage. And sometimes that isn't authentic because it's not you it's not what you want, but you feel like you play this guessing game of like, okay, what's Gavin expecting from me right now? Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he hasn't verbalized that, but what's he want from me? So what do I need to do? How do I mold myself to shift to be who he wants me to be? And then, and then it leaves us feeling unfulfilled. It leaves us like being like, why did I just do all that? Or, or you, you, you hit such a high being on the stage and then you hit such a low after you're like, all right, well, that's over. All right. Yeah. And that, and, and like, you know, say what you want about the woo woo, but like your highest self is like, that's not aligned with who you actually are. You know, that's not you. That's not. And, and then let's go back to intention. Your intention is way off, right? It's your intention is not to, is not to perform to the best of your ability 
because you, you know, you want to do the best for yourself. It's to perform to what someone else says is the standard, which is yeah. way off, way misaligned in terms of intentions. And, and, and yeah, and you can even peel that back to, to life where you can find yourself if that's the lens you continuously go through, um, you end up living other people's life. Which is a big thing that I found that I was doing. And actually that, Me too. you know, we even look, yeah. And we even look at in the coaching world. So you're in the coaching world, obviously not in the fitness world, like a lot of our clients are, but you're in the coaching world. And it's like, I find so many fitness professionals and coaches in general, even I've found myself falling into the trap go, well, this is what the other people are doing. This is what everybody else is doing. So I don't, you know, what, uh, there's some sort of a quote around like, you know, build your life for you. You know, don't, don't steal someone else's life. I think I shared that on Instagram a few weeks ago, like build your own life. Don't build someone else's. And the problem is, is that that takes work. That takes, that takes time. That takes awareness that takes, you know, digging into the deepest parts of yourself so that you can go, no society or the coach or whoever is telling me this, that doesn't align with me. Yeah. This aligns with me. And, and, and that's, you know, society, society, society's played such a heavy role and we all are attached to experiences and stories that have happened to us. And so we've created and put ourselves in a box Mm. and, and then, and then we find ourselves at a point where we're like, what am I doing? Like what's going on? And it's like to what you said, it's so, it's so simple yet. It's so different because the most success that you will have is when you are your most authentic self, but creating the clarity, the intention, the grounding of who that actually is, and then consistently showing up for that. When we have all, when we have what the media is saying, when we have what family, friends, other coaches or people in our space are saying, it's like, how can I block that out and stay grounded in my authentic self? Because Mm. that's where you're going to find the most fulfillment and success because you're being truly you. Yes. And this makes me think of this. uh, There was a podcast. I think it was Tim Ferriss's podcast where he asked someone about like, you know, the most successful people, who do you think of as the most successful people? And, and the, the person said, well, we have to know what their intention is to know if they're successful, right? Mm. Like, like Richard Branson, if he wanted to live a quiet, simple life, he ain't doing very well. Yeah. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like that's not a very good thing, but because like, so we're taking these things from other people who have totally different experiences, totally different intentions, totally different, um, missions and visions for what they want their legacy to be in the world. And we're trying to take that. And again, this is a lesson from like, well, your coach told you what to do. So you're trying to go, okay, well, I'm going to take that and I'm going to do everything that I can to fit into that so that you'll play me more so that I'll get more chances, but yeah, something to unlearn and some masks to pull off as we, as we get into life and business and and other non-athletic endeavors. Right. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that I've learned works really well because to what you just said, it's super powerful. If we as coaches are talking about intentions, missions, and we're pushing it and pushing it and the client or someone just starts building and creating, they can get lost in it. And where I find the most power working with people is really giving them the space to define what that means for them. Because what it means for me can mean differently for you. And and what I don't want to do is a disservice by projecting onto you what my intentions or intentions mean in my eyes through my experience. So what I find the most power and the most empowering for clients is regardless of what we're talking about, let's define it. Let's define it in your experience. Don't worry about mine. I just want the space for you to define it so that you have ownership over the strong foundation that you're building. Yeah. Cause then, and then when someone has ownership, then it's like, this is all me. This Mm -hmm. is all my choice. This is all. And, and, and all you're really doing as the coach or as, you know, as that guide is you're just supporting that. And, and, you know, maybe, 
maybe providing providing accountability and then providing another perspective and just being like, right. yeah, okay, that works. Let's yeah. let's go with that. Yeah. And that's that's like this, like I think the new, the 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 real way to coach, you know, is to guide, is to mentor, is to allow them to come to the conclusion themselves while providing some sort of a pathway. Yeah. Um, I I always talk about, I always talk about it all the time with my coach, shout out to Nick Pags. And uh, I talk about it all the time with like other people that I work with. And I love that I have this lens for myself and some people naturally do, but coming from an education background to a coaching background, I look at it at, at the, in the perspective of, is it a teacher centered approach or is it a student centered approach? Right. And in, in education, a teacher centered approach is students are sitting there and the teacher is just delivering, just delivering content, just boom, 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 boom. And those kids might be retaining it. They might hear it, but it's not resonating. It's not grounding because there's no ownership for them. So you know what? That's that teacher center approach. They're getting it. They're getting it. They know what pages to read in the book. They do it. They show up to the test. They take the test. They, a week later, you ask them about it. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Teacher centered approach, student centered approach is all about meeting them where they're at inquiry, all these things, really taking what you want to talk about, what you want to teach and get it through the lens of them by asking them question to gauge where they're at, asking them what things mean, asking things, what asking them things like, what does it look like? How would it show up? That's a student-centered approach. It's all focused on the student and where they are. And so as I go into coaching and as I go into the work I do with my clients, that's always a reminder for me before I go into a call or a meeting with a client or with a group or a workshop. It's always about my intention to make it student-centered and not me just delivering. Man. And didn't we grow up in a teacher-centered uh, oh. curriculum? <laughs> Here's a textbook. I'm going to hammer you with basically exactly what was written in the textbook already for 40 minutes. And then you're going to go answer questions based on what I just hammered you on with zero ownership of it at all. <sighs> That's it. That's it. That's what we grew up in. That's it. And then, and then you're, and then, and then your value as a student is determined on the grade that you get because someone created a time frame for how long it was supposed to take you to learn, retain, and know the information. And and then, depending on your parents and their values, your yeah. value as a human, yeah, and as a as a person may be tested based on that. And you know, your, the love that you receive or lack thereof could be tested based on that, which, uh, yeah, that, that is leading to a very concerning and broken, uh, methodology of, of quote unquote yeah. learning or coaching or yeah. teaching. And I love, I love that you make that analogy. And, and that's where I think you have so much value to bring. Now you, you were in the education world, decided to leave what real quick background, what did you do? Why did you decide yeah. to leave if you're willing to share? Yeah, for sure. So I spent nine years in education. Most of my um, experience as a classroom teacher was in an elementary school setting. And I was mainly in the New York City public school systems. Um, so I was in the Bronx, I was in Brooklyn. And a lot of the work I did to kind of what we were talking about was all rooted in relationships. That was what it was for me. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was like, I just love connecting with kids. I love helping them see that they can be just the best version of them. And so that's that's what the foundation was. And as I got more experience and things like that, um, I realized that I wanted to impact that on a larger scale because I saw to what we were just talking about, a lot of focus was coming from the academic side of things. Well, we're living in a world today where you don't need, like, it doesn't matter if you know fractions, like you're, you'll get fractions, but like your value as a human being, what you contribute to society, the type of person that you are, the type of way you communicate and handle relationships and handle 
failures and successes is not determined on if you know fractions. It's yes. determined on what are those soft skills that you're building? What is that awareness that you're building for yourself? So that led me into seeking um, educational leadership. And so I went into um, being an assistant principal at an elementary school. Um, and so I spent three years doing that um, before transitioning out. And the reason for my transitioning was I think education is making a great push towards what they deem now social emotional learning, really making sure students have empathy, perspective taking, growth mindset, awareness, all of those pieces, really strong foundational things that I think are going to serve people well. But there's still just such a focus on academics. And, and what I realized was just, I really got clarity on where my passions lie. And I felt like I was doing people a disservice sitting in meetings, talking about reading strategies, talking about how we're going to teach kids the next math unit coming up. Not that I wasn't, not that I wasn't effective in, in leading and working with teams, but it wasn't there for me. And, and I got to a point where I was like, I want to be able to really support and help people understand all the inner workings of themselves, all of the things that I had to suppress for a long time, all the things that, that our parents and grandparents and even people of our age group don't even have awareness around. I want to start bringing those things to light. I'm going to start having conversations around that. Um, and that, that's what led me into getting um, um, certified as a life coach and then stepping into my space now of, of a lot of like um, mindset work, best self work, confidence, masculinity work, especially with men. Yeah. Oh man. And it's like, it's so great to see, you know, one of our coaches is a mom and she said one of her kids came home with a growth mindset sheet. And it's yeah. like, it's so great to see that, but yeah, you still think like, and I'd love, I'm just curious at this point, cause you got, you taught through this is like, what did the invention of Google do to, like do to teaching? I mean, I, if I, if there was a math problem that I had to solve, I had to solve it. But like, if you give me homework now and I'm like a relatively resourceful kid, I'm just gonna be like, well, fuck this. I'm just going to Google it. Like, how did that change it? Like, did, did, were there, were there ways that you guys could find around that or how, like, how do you stop a kid from just Googling something? You know, you can't. You, you really can't. At the end of the day, if a kid wants to know something, they can look it up. If a kid wants to know something and their parent doesn't want to deal with it, they can ask their parent and their parent's going to tell them. Right. But going to the social emotional learning side of it, right? How do you, how, how I love, I love what this is called, right? I, we talked about it a lot in education. How can you create something for a child that is a productive struggle? How do you create something for them where they have an, a sense and a, an idea of what they have to do? They know that there's easy way, ways out, but how can you teach them perseverance? How can you teach them determination? How can you teach them the value of not solving the problem, but what is, how does that make you feel? How do you feel before you go and write that essay? that you don't want to write. Yeah. And then how do you feel on the, on the tail end of it? When you push through, when you found success, when you had to go deep within to pull that out of yourself, that's where the beauty in the longevity of teaching is. Cause it's not about the essay. It's not Nothing about to do with the essay, about, right? Because that child or that person is going to be in a relationship, is going to go and get a job, is going to experience anything in life where there's going to be a setback or there's going to be something that they're confronted with where they don't know how to navigate it. Do you have the skills? Do you have the toolkit as an adult to push through it? Yeah, that's so like one of the things just to touch on that point of I love that productive struggle. We do, uh, it's productive because there's a lot of health benefits, but what we do is near the end of our course is one of our discomfort challenges is, uh, to, to jump in a cold shower every day, right. For a week. And you know, the dial's right there. 
you, you can easily just turn it to hot. And it's like, it's very easy to take the easy way out. But once you've had that shower, not only do you feel physically invigorated, but you're like, fuck yeah, I stood under that thing and I didn't want to. There's some huge benefit there of like, I can trust myself. I can build, I can, I can build this muscle. I'll be okay. Yeah. I can deal with hard things. It goes back to intention. Mm -hmm. We all have, I mean, Gavin, we live in a beautiful world now, right? There, there's a lot of things in a social aspect that, that we as a world are struggling with. But we live in the most magnificent time right now. By far, yeah. Like there's so much at our fingertips. But I say intention because when you're standing in that shower that you know you need to take for a week and it's cold and that dials right there. It's like, it's not about the shower. It's not about the math problem. It's not, it's right. not about the actual action itself. It's the intention and the grounding behind it. And it's asking yourself the question of, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Am I doing it to take a cold shower? No. Why are you doing it? The real reason why. Because when shit hits the fan in your business and you know, you're having a tough month, you're going to be like, you know what? I can, I can get through this. I'll be okay. You know, or yeah. Or, you know, you're, you're struggling to connect with your partner or whatever it is. You you can get through that. I, I really, that's the kind of stuff that we need. That's the kind of stuff that we need to learn as we're growing up. I wanted to further to that productive struggle. I think one of the biggest things that you coach on that I've noticed is confidence. And I have this funny story. I always remember, you know, struggling in hockey, you know, junior hockey, struggling in hockey coach calls me into the office and says, uh, you need to play with more confidence. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is there a store I can go buy that at or what, you know, like where would you like me to go find that, you know? Yeah. And, and they, but they didn't, they couldn't, I couldn't really verbalize that question. And then they couldn't really verbalize an answer of like, how, how do I create confidence when I don't feel confident right now? You know, how do I do that? I think you probably are going to have a lot of thoughts on this, but your thoughts on creating or building confidence just in general. And then we can go deeper. Cause I know there's some masculine stuff that you really talk about, but yeah. just in general, like, let's say someone who doesn't feel good about creating social media content, or d- maybe doesn't feel good in their coaching skills, or maybe doesn't feel good in their sales skills or finding a partner, whatever it is, how do we intentionally build confidence? Yeah. Well, even, even to just your example, I think the first thing, and, and I was saying it before is like, we need to define, you need to define what confidence means to you. And, and one thing I talk through with people is like, let's define it. So based on your experience, what does confident look like to you? And so people will go through whatever experience they have to say exactly what they think it means. And then what I always, what I always had them do is take that definition and correlate it to a time in their life that they've been confident. Cool. So you said these things. Now think back. When have you felt that? Like, like really close your eyes and visualize the moment. How were you feeling? What were you doing? What it like, what did it look like? Tell me, tell me about it. Yep. Because I think so often people go, I I just don't have it. Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 no. You have it, but you need one, you need to gain clarity around what it is. And two, you need to bring yourself back to when you had it. So you bring yourself back to a moment when you had it. So then you, you're starting to move a little bit. And then, and then the question turns to, well, now let's look at areas of your life. Where is that missing? Mm. And then it's, and then it's, it's an idea of, okay, well, based on what you've defined confidence as, what would it look like showing up for social media? What would it look like showing up for how you coach people? Right. And then let's start thinking about the steps and let's just take one step at a time. What's one thing you're going to do this week to commit to building your confidence in coaching? Maybe that's hopping on a couple of calls with people to just start talking a little bit more. Maybe that's networking and getting in people's DMs. Maybe that's making sure you're posting once a day, whatever that looks like for that person. 
How can you then put it into the sector of your life where you're lacking that confidence? Yes. And then would you also say then like, so that's the starting point and that's a very valuable starting point. And then would you say that as we continue on through that, so, okay, I've got that like spark now, Mm -hmm. now I need to like really hammer this home. Is that just, does that just become uh, an act of building trust within yourself? Like just doing the things you say you're going to do, doing the things that you know are the right things. Like what, you know, what's the next step to like really becoming confident and like more certain in yourself, so to speak. Uh, Well, going, going back to what I was saying before, you know, we have a choice. We can either live based on who we were, or we can live based on who we want to be. And a lot of times where we lack confidence is because we attach ourselves to our experiences and stories that we've had. And why? Because they're comfortable. They might make us unhappy, but they're comfortable because we know them. The, the devil we know. The devil we know. Correct. Right. But I think, the, I think the other side of that, Gavin, is to then define for yourself, who do you want to be? And how do you create who you want to be? And it's all about clarity. It's all about actually understanding what that is and then start becoming that person. So many people say, oh, I'll be confident when I get that new car. or I'm going to be confident when I get that new job or I'm in that next relationship. And when we're minds are operating like that, we're waiting. We're trying to attach ourselves to something external. And the confidence is not an external thing. And it's funny because confidence is, is kind of looked at in society of like what you're putting out to people. Yeah. And confidence is actually the opposite. It's actually one of the most personal experiences because it's all about what you're doing here. It's all about determining who do you want to be? What do you want to create? And even if you're not that person right now, what steps are you taking to start operating like that? Mm Mm-hmm. What, and then it's just a matter of continuing to take those actions, even in the face yeah. of fear, even in the face of struggle, just take right. some action towards that. Like what's and, the, and, the easiest thing you can do? Yeah. And, and to what we were saying before too, it's unlearning all of those things, unlearning, mm-hmm. like processing through the stories you're telling yourself, processing through the experiences that you held on to, whether you knew about it or not detaching from it because you're living your life in the box. You're not living your life in, in the world of possibility. You're living your life in the world of, of what you knew. And it's, and it's, and it's unsettling to you yet. It's comfortable. So you stay there. Yeah, this is, I had this conversation with actually more than one client in the past few days around, um, you know, say money mindset, let's take, for example, money mindset, like, well, how am I ever going to make 10 K a month when I've only ever made 4 K a month? And it's like, well, you making 4 K a month next month is as likely as you making 10 K a month next month. And they're like, what? It's like, (laughs) well, how is it any different? The only thing is, you know, this and you've done this before, but what if you found a pile of gold in your basement. Like you have no idea what's going to happen in the future. So you may as well step into that future self instead of living in the past. That's all Joe Dispenza talks a lot about that. He's like, if we're in, if we're not in the present or future, we're actually living in the past, right? We're like, and, and that seems like a silly comment to say, but it's something that a lot of people don't think about is like, you're actually living in the past. If you're not very clear on who you want to be, what you want to do, what you want to get, and then acting in accordance with that. Yeah. And and you start to ask those questions. Like, how come I can't get 10 K a month? How come I'm not doing this? And it's like, well, let's, let's scale back and let's look at what you're doing. And as you talk through it, you're like, well, it's because you're living in who you were. You're living in this box that you're putting yourself in. My question to you is why are you putting yourself in that box? If you want to be this person, right? Let's get clear on who you want to be now. Great. You're making 4k this month. You want to make 10. Are there any things that you may need to do differently? 
how do you step into that? So your, so your vibration, your energy, what your intentions are, your actions are aligning with the 10 K person a month you want to be. Man, there it is. Drop the mic, baby. Uh, (laughs) yes. Okay. Let's, let's go. You know, this is something that I've found to be not, I mean, in the, in my life has not been easy around, uh, getting, I guess maybe you can define this better, but confident in your masculinity and, but also like, I always lived in what, what would be called kind of a wounded masculine space yeah. of, of, of trying to, you know, externally, I call myself a recovering bro. You know, yeah. I was very bro, very like external, like, you know, love me, validate me. I'm the yeah. best. Yeah. How can we become, I guess maybe you can define it, but is it confident in our masculinity or like, how would you kind of define that? Yeah. Well, I would say that as society, right. Exactly to your points of like, look at me, center of attention, love me. I need to, I need to be in the spotlight. I need to be the loudest person in the room. I need to be the most witty person to like crack the joke first. Right. I need to put others down. That's how we've been built from a societal sense of like what masculinity means. Right. And when you peel those layers back, kind of like Lewis Howes with the mask of masculinity, right? Like those are all fronts. Those, and not all the time, right? Some of us have those personalities, but a lot of it is masking insecurity or it's faulty masculinity. And so when I talk masculinity, I'm talking about the most beautiful, authentic version of masculinity and confidence. And that's all about understanding who you are as a person, understanding the person that you want to be, understanding your emotions, and also being able to translate that to the things that you do, to how you show up for yourself, to the people that you show up for. Because when you're clear on that, going back to clarity and intention, when you're clear and you're intentional with who you are and who you want to be, and you leave yourself open and vulnerable to start looking within, it's unbelievable how you show up for yourself and other people in life. Yes. It's unbelievable. I'm just like, so many things are ripping through my head right now. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> and I mean, that's just that, the, that, that definition or the thing that we keep coming back to the, I think dancing around is like, when you take care of what's inside here, you can show up externally in, in a much better way. Confidence, well, because, masculinity, whatever. Yeah, because too, you know, it's, it's the sense of, well, you got to take care of your family, you got to provide you, you got to show up, you got to be strong. And what, what sometimes we fail to realize is you can be those things with also being in touch internally. Mm. A lot of times those get associated with suppression. Oh, well, I don't have time to acknowledge how I'm feeling because I need to show up for my kids or I need to show up for my wife or I need to show up at work. And so let me put on this front. And we all know that whether you're a male or a female, when we put on these fronts and we suppress things, they're going to show up even more and more in other areas of our life, even if we're not even conscious of it. Mm -hmm. And so what it's really doing is, is understanding like, what does masculinity mean? And what does pure masculinity mean? None of this bullshit fake stuff that is just a front that leaves us unfulfilled on the inside because men, we're human beings. We're all feeling these things. Like none of this BS where it's not me. I guarantee you, if you're a bro or if you're someone who's listening to it being like, I don't talk about that shit. I don't have it going on. 100% you're running from it. Yeah. And I guarantee you, you could be more confident. You could be more masculine with yourself, with your girl, with your family, with your friends, with your work. If you just took the time to develop the deepened relationship with self and understand that you're not weak, you're not broken, Mm -hmm. you're pure, you're human. And that's when you step into the purest form of masculinity. So powerful. And do you feel like, because of, you know, speaking to not only all this stuff, but then the world that you and I grew up in and, you know, being in our thirties. So now 
we are the men that are becoming parents. It's kind of our duty at this point in, in this world. Like, I think I said this to you on our last conversation, like we're not that far from removed from like the dad being like, I got to go get some fucking money for my family because we have, we don't even have running water. Right. We're in a place now where we can go higher on Maslow's hierarchy, where we can go to that next place. And I feel like it's kind of like, we are the transition. We're the transition generation where it's like gone from like, because all our dads, especially our grandparents were like that, or the majority of them are like that. It's black and white. You're, you're, yeah. you, you know, you don't do both. You're not yeah. in touch with yourself and strong and a provider. Yeah. Right. So you've probably said this and maybe I just was too excited about what you were saying. Do you have any like very clear, like, I don't want to say tips, but very clear action oriented thoughts for what someone, what a guy like me or you, who's like, holy shit, that's Mm -hmm. me. What can they do today? I think, I think the first thing you can do is just actually not run from it. If you're feeling something, if something's unsettling to you, if you're, if you're finding yourself like short fused or you're finding yourself not having the strong relationships that you want at work or you just don't seem to be aligned with your girl or your partner like whatever that is like stop saying like that's life or stop saying like well i'm just gonna wait for her to fix it or i'm just gonna wait for work to figure itself out or it's not on me like it starts with you man pause ask yourself two questions how am I feeling and why am I feeling this way? That's it. That's where you start. Start by just actually taking time to acknowledge the emotion that you're feeling and realize that all emotions matter. There is no, there is no negative or positive emotion. And that's a whole, Gavin, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> of, of, of that. And that's a huge passion of mine, but that's also why I speak a lot um, and have, have my method that I work with men on, right? Like all emotions matter. And, and, and for any men listening, like I want you to hear this, that every action you take is driven by an emotion. Someone cut you off, you honk at them. Why? Cause you're pissed. Your action honking. Yes. Your girl says something, you slam a door. What? You slam the door as the action because of an emotion that you're feeling. But we live in such an automatic that we just do it and we don't take the time. So men, all I'm asking you to do to just start doing this is bring awareness to how you're feeling. Mm. Just ask yourself. You don't need to sit there and have a kumbaya and hug and sing and, and meditate. You can, but you don't you can. have can. That'd be kind of cool, right? No, but... If you're driving in the car, if you're working out, if you're running, whatever, whatever you do, take a moment to just ask yourself, how am I feeling? And, and, and regardless of how you're feeling, why are you feeling that way? Mm. Just start to actually listen to yourself. Mm. So powerful. And I, I actually think just like that is a great microcosm of everything we've talked about just, you know, taking a moment and and just making sure that you're like, okay, well, what's going on here? Becoming, becoming more in touch with and getting to know the person inside of you a little bit better is going to benefit everything that we've talked about. Um, Uh, It's a, it's, it's, you know, my, my main overarching idea for men is we have to stop living in automatic and we have to start living intentionally. And that's how we get to our purest form of masculinity. Oh, that is. And (laughs) important for men, women listening, you can start living intentionally too. Yeah. Or continue living intentionally. It's very important, but, and kids and everybody like, but yes, I agree with you. Like a lot of men in particular are on, you know, on, on autopilot. And And I, and I, I work with and speak to, a lot of men and a lot of my content is directed towards men, but I also speak with women too, because like you just said, what I'm talking about is not just males dealing with it. 
I resonate with males. I am a male. I've had experiences of what I'm talking through, but I do similar work with women as well. Mm. Yeah. So I, I honestly feel like we're just getting started, but I have to cut you off. You said you work with men and women. Where can people learn more about a learning from you and just listening to what you have to say and be actually uh, possibly working with you? Yeah, for sure. The best way to find me is through Instagram at Griffin Gervais. You'll see that I have my content on there. I'll put all the links for like workshops and webinars that I have going on. That's the best way to get in touch with me. Slide into my DMs. Have Friend a conversation, me. baby. Yeah, have a conversation. Touch base. Let me know what resonates with you. I will never shy away from a conversation. So, so reach out. That's the best way to, um, to contact me. Amazing, man. Well, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Is there you've dropped many knowledge bombs. Is there one final piece of advice for those of those that are still listening and didn't click off and say, Oh, the the episode's over. Is there one final thing you have for them? I think just, just that, just hammering home that piece of there's so much that we do day to day. And there's so many things that we can, we can fill our time with, and that creates our automatic lives. And no matter who you are, no matter what you do, you don't need to ask yourself those questions, whatever it is, create stillness and pause in your day, whether that's a walk, whether that's reading, whether that's breath work, whether that's listening to your favorite song, whatever that is, do that. Don't let time just pass you by live in the present moment and just pause. Such an incredible way to just tie this all up because what a great way to get intentional, to get aware, yeah. just pause. Thank you so much, Griffin. I can't wait to do this again. Awesome. Appreciate you. So thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you'd like to learn more about how I can help you specifically, check out the show notes and click the link to my website. You'll learn more about what we do here at Maverick Coaching Academy. And we can actually even set up a quick clarity call to discuss if and how we may be able to help you. Thank you and have a beauty day.